Our first speaker today is Imam Arthur Farrakhan. He is the resident Imam of the Muslim American community of Tulsa, elected to that position in 1978. He has held many offices with various interfaith groups and others over the past 35 years, and I'm so proud to have him at our series this year. Please welcome Imam Arthur Farrakhan. Greetings. Greetings. We thank Almighty God, the creator of us all, for this tremendous opportunity to share a little bit about what we believe in. Uh, the best way to, uh, to share is to share with you a verse from our holy book. This is chapter five, entitled Ma'ida, or the table spread. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَدُوا وَالسَّبِيُونَ وَالنَّصَارَى مَنْ أَمْنَا بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَا خَافُونَ لَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ صَرَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَذِينَ إِنِّي أَشْمَدُ مِنْ يُسْرَ عَلِيْهِ Those who believe in the Qur'an, those who follow the Jewish scriptures, and the Sabians and the Christians, any who believe in God in the last day and work righteousness, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. When I got the invitation to, um, to share these words, we always are asking the Almighty to favor us to direct us, to show us signs of how we should proceed. And I keep hearing this word table. I heard it a while ago. Table. And the name of this particular chapter is the table spread. Who was it spread for? It spread for everybody who believes in the Creator, no matter what we call him. And that's why it says here, those who believe in the Quran, those who follow the Jewish scriptures, the saviors, the Christians, any who believe in God in the last day and work righteousness, does good, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. So who should be at this table? Everybody who's trying to do the will of the Creator to the best of their ability. No one is left out of the table. And you bring your best to the table. You know, we look, we get a knock at the door. And we say, who's at the door? And it's dinner time. And you got good chicken and good vegetables and you're ready to eat. And you say, well, that's, uh, that's Leroy. Well, put the chicken and stuff up. Bring out the tuna fish. Let's wait until Leroy leaves here before we get the good food. No, you bring the very best out. The very best that you have, you bring that to the table and you share that uh, with every human being. And believe me, I've been very blessed to have been throughout the world some. In fact, in 1999, we were the guests of His Holiness Pope Paul John II. We I say we, Imam W. D. Muhammad, who inherited the leadership of the nation of Islam from his father, Dr. Elijah Muhammad, when he passed, and we were invited uh, to the Vatican to share with about 100,000 people at St. Peter's uh, Square uh, the, uh, uh, the, the message that God has blessed us to come together. And, and those in the, uh, in, in the ecumenical community, in fact, the Pope himself invited us because he saw a miracle in modern America that you may or may not be aware of. But back in the day, I was in a community known as the Nation of Islam. And in the Nation of Islam, uh, we didn't uh, allow Caucasians or uh, non-African Americans to participate. We didn't participate in the political process. We didn't vote. In fact, our creed was looking to separate from America. And we changed. We changed, and now Almighty God has brought us to the table. And if we can change, and we, this needs to be a message for the whole world. If we can change, 
Every human being can become better than what you are and what I am today. That's what we bring to the table. We bring the very best that we can to the table. We don't exclude any human being. I don't know about you, but I, yes, I do. None of you had a choice in choosing your skin color. None of you had a choice in choosing your gender or whether you were born rich or poor. So Almighty God does not judge us on things that we didn't have a part to play in. I didn't choose this. God gave it to me. So we have to choose the best of us. Look at us today. I love this. I'm looking around the room and I don't see any Muslim air, Jewish air, Christian air. I don't see any Muslim light and Jewish light and etc. We're one. We're one humanity. And God in his wisdom made us different so that we can get to know each other, so we can get acquainted. The Quran said, lead to out of food. Get acquainted. Have regard for one another. And wouldn't it be a really a boring world if all of us look just alike? If I went home today, or my sweet wife over there, if I went over there after I got through talking, and she looked like I was the fur kind, I'd have to give me some strong coffee. <laughs> so God in his wisdom made us different so that we can get acquainted with each other and learn about each other. Some say God, Vishnu, Allah, Elway, uh, uh, Elohim, Vishnu, there are all kinds of words for this one creator, but we're talking about one and the same. So if we can pass this, this image, if we can pass these stereotypes and really come to know one another, we'll find that humanity is one. If we close our eyes and we heard a baby cry, and we say, tell me what language that baby is crying in. They say, I don't know, it's a strange thing though. The Nigerian baby, the Caucasian baby, the African American baby, all them babies are crying in the same language. I close my eyes and I can't distinguish the difference. God is telling us in our beginning that we are one. God is telling us now that we are one. And the work that you all are doing, the work that we're doing, this love that we have for working with other human beings, the world needs that right now. You're videoing this. She got a copy to, to the president and others. Yeah, what's taking place? Yeah, in, 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 19, in 2000, I think, a group of us uh, went to the Holy Land for two weeks. A group of us from Tulsa in this area. And we were told that that was the first ecumenical really ecumenical group ever to go to the Holy Land uh, and those numbers were such a diverse group and we went and we showed the Jews and the Christians and others, the Muslims that we can get along in peace and harmony and uniting does not believe that we agree on everything the closest relationship other than the individual to the creator is a relationship of husband and wife. And I can tell you that my wife and I do not agree on everything. <laughs> and you and your wife don't agree on everything, but you still love each other. So those are the kind of examples that we need to show the world. That we love each other, we love each other's diversity, we love each other's differences, but after all of that, the different religious labels, et cetera, et cetera, different cultures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we know that we're one. One creator, one humanity. So I celebrate with you this tremendous thing that you're doing and that you continue to do. We've known Nancy for many, many years. I knew Nancy before I was bald-headed. So you know, that was about a long, long time ago. And she was still doing this work. She's committed to doing this work. And I'm, I'm thankful that she has such a strong board backing her. People that are doing this work, let's get behind them and push them. Because this may, this example, may be one of the things that's going to help to save America and help to save the world. Thank you very much. Very good. Well said. Thank you, Arthur. All right, our next speaker this afternoon is Priscilla Galston. Born and raised as a Catholic in India, she converted to Islam in 1999 after studying the three Abrahamic faiths. She is a member of the Islamic Society of Tulsa and volunteers as an American outreach coordinator for special events. 
Priscilla currently works right here at Peace Academy. Please welcome Priscilla Galston. Good evening. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I wore my highest heels today because I knew I was sharing the stage with God. <laughs> In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. All praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, the master of the day of judgment. I ask him to bless our endeavors and that they may be in our favor on the day of accountability. Thank you for taking the time to be here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon when we would rather be outside. I hope I make it worth your while, God willing. It's an honor to share the platform today with Imam Atha Farah Khan, a legend in his own right, along with Sister Jane, Sister Jolie, Sister Jeanne, and Dr. Don. Senator George Aiken once said, if we were to wake up one morning and find that everyone was the same race, same creed and color, we would find some other cause for prejudice by noon. So I guess that pretty much settles everything. Generally speaking, the view Muslims hold with regard to interfaith dialogue fall into two broad categories. There are those who believe it is wrong and not permitted, as do some people of other faiths. And then there are those who believe it is necessary and part of one's faith. Muslims who see no benefit in interfaith dialogue generally are of the opinion that one, it is a false and oftentimes dangerous call that forces us to compromise on our religious commitments. Two, that under the guise of establishing friendships and promoting understanding, interfaith events across the board seek to proselytize. Three, interfaith dialogue is an overarching call to support the concept of the unity of religions, which for a Muslim is equivalent to apostasy. And four, such endeavors don't really help to bring about any true and lasting change in regard to the political and social turmoil that is taking place across the globe. Besides these, there are those who harbor an isolationist worldview. And of course, there are those who truly believe that interfaith activism is not their calling, perhaps because they see it more as an intellectual endeavor and choose rather to participate in other socially uplifting projects like volunteering at the Red Cross or soup kitchens, orphanages and homeless shelters and so on. Muslim interfaith activists who recognize the need and the importance of interfaith dialogue see it for what it offers, a seat at the table, as Sir uh, Imam Atafara Khan just mentioned, a seat at the table for all religious and secular traditions, not to proselytize or seek the opportunity to temper or modify the ideology of the other, but with the singular mission to strive for the common good, for elucidating misconceptions, disseminating information, and educating hearts and minds. It is with these purposes that Muslim interfaith activists support and promote interfaith dialogue. Muslim interfaith activists attest to the reality that differences are not a cause for division or a curse to be endured, but instead serve as a reminder and as a clear evidence from God Almighty of his existence, his magnificence, and as a function of recognizing one another. There are several verses in the Quran that specifically call for our commonalities through honorable and meaningful communication with all of mankind. In chapter 17, verse 70, God Almighty says in translation, and we have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them to the land and sea and provided for them of the good things and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. 
In chapter 2, verse 44, God the Most Gracious narrates in translation, Do you order righteousness of the people and forget yourselves while you recite scripture? Then will you not reason? In chapter 4, verse 11, 1, it says, O mankind, fear your Lord, who created you from one soul and created from it its mate, and dispersed from both of them many men and women, and fear Allah, through whom you ask one another, and the wombs. Indeed, Allah is ever over you an observer. In chapter 49, verses 11 and 12, God Almighty addresses Muslims in particular with words that set the precedent for honorable and honest dialogue. In translation, O you who have believed, let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them. Let not women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them. And do not insult one another, and do not call each other by offensive nicknames. Wretched is the name of the disobedience after one's faith. And those who do not repent, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. O oh, you who have believed, avoid much negative assumption. Indeed, some assumption is sin. And do not spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his brother when dead? You would detest it and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is accepting of repentance and merciful. Interestingly enough, the very next verse shifts focus to all peoples. Here God Almighty addresses not just one group in particular, but he addresses all of mankind. It goes on to say, O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, and made you peoples and tribes, that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. In these three verses, God Almighty is reminding us that in order for us to collectively live up to our potential, we must desist from defamation, denigration, ad hominem attacks, and outrageous non sequiturs. We are reminded that we do not have the right to disrespect or dishonor people because we are all equal in our humanity. Yes, some may deserve more respect, affection, or compassion, but that does not mean we treat anyone less. When a society chooses collectively to go down that slippery slope, this eventually results in the decline of civility and respect within the populace. People of all faiths and ethnicities have their individual and collective rights in the community. And differences in race, color, language, and ethnicity bear no reflection on a person's position in society. On the contrary, the most noble and honored amongst us will be the one who is most righteous. There is a sound hadith or a tradition of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who once said, the believer who mingles with people and is patient with their annoyance earns more reward than a believer who does not mingle with people and does not observe patience with their annoyance. In these words and verses lie the key to the reality that in Islam, God Almighty condemns racism and prejudice and makes piety the criterion. God, the most gracious himself, is in meaningful communication with all of mankind, so why not you and I? As Muslims, when we dialogue with people of other faiths, we are not changing the standards set by God Almighty and his messenger, peace be upon him. We are in accordance to these verses, collectively trying to meet those standards. We live in increasingly tumultuous times. And as Sir Charles Peggy, who died in 1914, once wrote, the modern world debases. It debases the state, it debases man, it debases woman, it debases the race, it debases the child, it debases the nation, it debases family, it even debases death. 
I know of Muslims who are vilified, victimized, and terrorized on a daily basis. The situation has unfortunately spiraled so out of control that our Hindu and Sikh friends are victims of hate crimes only because they happen to be wrongly mistaken as Muslims. Halfway across the world, we stood by helplessly when Ambassador Chris Stevens was nefariously targeted and murdered by morally obtuse people. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never insulted anyone, let alone an ambassador. He treated them most honorably. Amidst this ongoing frenzy today, in a few hours from now, we will have Pamela Geller, who is going to be honored as the American Patriot of the Year at the Queen's Village Republican Club's 138th anniversary Lincoln Dinner. Truth, she says, is the new hate speech. While we may or may not agree with Pamela Geller, but if someone can recognize, can be recognized by the oldest Republican club in the United States as a champion of our First Amendment rights, then they ought to recognize Nancy Day and OCCJ, who are unprejudiced advocates of our First Amendment rights as well. On July 4, 1821, John Quincy Adams, in his speech to the U.S. House of Representatives, said, America's glory is not dominion, but liberty. Her march is the march of the mind. She has a spear and a shield, but the motto upon her shield is freedom, independence, peace. This has been her declaration. This has been as far as her necessary intercourse with the rest of mankind would permit her practice. It is this clarity of vision and meticulous thought that is rapidly disappearing from our discourse today, where Islamophobes and hate mongers are replacing them with a narrative of fear, repugnance, and hubris. It is not these United States that President Adams was referring to when men, women, children, indigenous and naturalized, black, white, and everything in between should have to live in fear for the way they look, for the way they dress, and for whom they choose to call God. These horrid, destabilizing times when freedom, independence, and peace are hanging in the balance, when we are inundated by vilifying rhetoric and spin, we no longer have the luxury of asking the question, why interfaith? Instead, we must continue to be a voice of reason, a voice of calm, and a voice of dignity. Because we are collectively up against a rhetoric and a discourse that is corrosive, divisive, and narcissistic. When technology is advancing at such an unprecedented rate that domestic acts of bigotry here are having tragic consequences the world over, when media is used as a weapon of mass deception, spreading hate and bias through misinformation and false propaganda, where Facebook statuses and Twitter tweets are rapidly redefining who we interfaith with, when iPhones iPads and iPods are changing how we interfaith. It is in these times and circumstances that we must ask the question, I interfaith, do you? Thank you. All right, let's continue. Our next speaker is Sister Jane Comerford. Sister Jane, a sister of the St. Joseph of Carondelet. I meant to get to you before I... Carondelet, I said it right. Uh, a sister of St. Joseph of Carondelet is the director of Spiritual Life Program at the Osage Forest of Peace Interfaith Retreat Center in Sand Springs. She has degrees in education and spirituality. Would you please welcome Sister Jane Comerford. I just said to Bill at this moment, I wish I was a Pentecostal speaker. <laughs> After the fire and brimstone from the Islamic presenters. I'm a contemplative, what can I say? <laughs> 
but thank you for giving me this opportunity to um, OCCJ, to the committee who invited me. I'm really happy to be here to speak of my own experience of interfaith dialogue. It says in your program that my life took a new direction in 1993 when I attended the second parliament on world religions in Chicago. There had only been one world parliament on religion in history back in 1893 and the meeting was the centennial celebration of that historic event and in that event the majority in 1893 of the people who attended were white and there was one man from the east Vivekananda who introduced the Western world to Eastern religion go up a hundred years later the majority of the people there were not white and the majority of the topics were the presenters were not Christian so a revolution in the world in a hundred years I met people of all different faiths from all over the world at that Parliament and was impressed with their holiness and the, their faithfulness to their tradition at one of the workshops I attended I learned that 90% of the wars in the world had been fought over religion and at that moment in time I became dedicated to promoting world peace through interfaith dialogue and experience I just couldn't imagine why can't people get along I bet all of you have had that same question. Why can't we live in peace and harmony? But I was so moved when I heard that. Somehow it touched my heart and it, it was a turning point in my life. I was already the director of a spirituality center in Seattle, Washington, and I had already begun leading pilgrimages to the East to educate Westerners on the wisdom traditions of the world. My ministry then took on an additional meaning to me as I led those pilgrimages with an additional intent in my heart that it was one small gesture towards world peace. What I found most helpful it then was not just learning the doctrines of other traditions, being educated about the traditions, but experiencing the prayer life of the traditions entering into some of the rituals of other traditions and experiencing what they viewed and saw and experienced as their God of their understanding helped me greatly expand mine. My world became interfaith, linking to others from Hinduism and Buddhism and Judaism and Islam. I learned that you could stand strong in your own faith as you learn from other traditions. This led me to further interfaith work. I went to many sacred sites throughout the world and learned that there are many paths up the mountain of, to God. And for me, what counts in interfaith dialogue is the movement of the heart, not the movement of the head. Sometimes your head has to be moved, but it better trickle down to your heart for real understanding and acceptance, not just tolerance of the other. When I look back at my life, it would seem unlikely that I would become so involved in the interfaith world. I grew up in a rural community in upstate New York where there were just two churches, a Roman Catholic church and a Methodist church. It was a narrow world that held its own bigotry and prejudice. I happened to be the only Catholic girl in my class in school, and all my friends were Methodists. My ecumenical relationships began there, but not in such a positive light. We weren't allowed to go into each other's churches, and the Protestant world was seen as a danger to my faith. I think back to an incident when one of my friend's fathers died. He had been a Catholic who had converted and become a Methodist. Now my mother told me that because he had left the Catholic Church, he would not go to heaven. He was going to go, of course, to hell. I felt so bad for him and for my friend, and I actually told her. Now, can you imagine that? 
But that was what my faith formation told me at the time, and I can see some of you shaking your head. You had the same teaching. Now picture me talking to that same friend 40 years later when she was a nurse working in a hospital where my brother was a patient. I hadn't seen her in about 40 years. We both immediately spoke of that incident. Obviously she had never forgotten it and neither had I. I apologized to her, trying to tell her how sorry I was that I'd ever made that statement and that I knew it wasn't true. I think she found it hard to believe me. It was a humbling experience. So what had happened to me in those 40 years that changed my understanding and beliefs? What had happened to transform me? Well, the Catholic Church went through a radical change during the Second Vatican Council. By the early 1960s, the Vatican had grown tired of having frayed relationships with other religious groups and reformulated their millennia-old interfaith policy. And the old policy was, have little to do with anybody. Keep your position. Don't enter into interfaith dialogue. But in 1965, the church issued Nostra Etate, its seminal document on interfaith dialogue. It was the first time the Vatican advocated for interfaith dialogue between Catholics and other religions. I was fortunate after that then to become educated about the world faith traditions and was given many opportunities to come to a better understanding through workshops and experiences. Since that time, members of the Roman Catholic Church have consistently entered into interreligious dialogue and they continue to do so today. Uh, Reverend Farrakhan said, Amon Farrakhan said that he was invited to be with Pope John Paul II. And that's very, that's true. And John Paul II offered many times meeting with other religious leaders of the world, uh, and particularly in prayer at Assisi, that he invited them to come together and worship and pray together. Pope Benedict, Benedict XV has taken a more moderate and cautious approach, stressing the need for intercultural dialogue, but the interfaith dialogue also continues. My faith tradition does not have rules or laws that say to do interfaith work in its sacred texts. However, there's, there's no law that says do this. Do, do not do interfaith work or do interfaith work. What we do have is the example of Jesus Christ, who seemed to have no difficulty entering into dialogue with those around him. He spoke with a stranger, the outcasts, those different from him, and some of his strongest teachings are about offering hospitality to all and inclusivity. So a stance of hospitality inherently offers dialogue to those you come in contact with. Jesus told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. How can we do that possibly if we avoid our interfaith neighbor and do not enter into dialogue with them? Now my ministry has brought me to Oklahoma where I'm the director for the spiritual life of the Forest of Peace in Sand Springs. And I'm really happy to be able to speak of this place because it's, it is unique, unique in the United States. There are very few places doing what we're doing. What are we doing? Some of you may be familiar, there used to be the Osage Monastery that a group of sisters uh, lived in and ran. It's evolved into an interfaith, interspiritual retreat center. It's a place where people of any faith can come and experience their connection with a source of faith. This is the newest chapter in interfaith work. Move your language from interfaith to interspiritual. Most of us know we'll never agree on dogma and doctrine. Some are closer, some of our traditions are closer than others. But we can come together in the experience of the Holy One. That's what inner spiritual is about. Tell me, what's your experience of the Holy One? And I'll tell you mine. And I will tell you 
the practices I practice in order to have this experience. And I'm interested in you. How do you pray? So it's in the Forest of Peace, we're creating an inner spiritual staff live-in community, representing different traditions. And like Martin Luther King, we all have that dream that we can live in peace and harmony. This is about peace and harmony and equality by living together, proving you can have different people, different cultures, different religions in one place, praying together, meditating together, and living in harmony. I've left brochures out front, so it's an inv open invitation for you to come visit the Forest of Peace. Part of this conference also was hoping for younger people to be here, to come here, the high touch, the high tech. This is what young adults want. They want the experience of the Divine One through prayerful practices. The Forest of Peace helps make that happen. And I personally think that's the future of interfaith work, is to have this happen more and more to come together in prayerful settings. Last week at a presentation on hate groups in America, Ms. Leisha Brooks quoted from Dr. Martin Luther King, who once said, people are afraid of each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other. I agree that the only way to eradicate fear is to get to know another person. This applies to interfaith relations and dialogue, and we continue to need it as we continue to need to know and respect others as individuals and as nations in order to have that peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker this afternoon, Dr. Don Pittman. He is Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dean, and the William Tabernay Professor of the History of Religions at Phillips Theological Seminary here in Tulsa. An ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ Church, he holds two advanced degrees from Vanderbilt University and a PhD in the History of Religions from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Would you please welcome Dr. Don Pittman. Good afternoon. I'm appreciative of the presenters today and especially grateful for Sister Jane's helpful comments on Roman Catholic Christianity with special reference to Vatican II. I understand that my task today is to try to explain from the viewpoint of Protestant Christianity and its hundreds of independently established and often sharply divided and competing denominational and non-denominational churches in North America what the Bible, and especially the New Testament, has to say about interfaith dialogue in a quick survey of no more than 10 minutes. <laughs> hey, no problem. No problem. Why? Because interreligious dialogue is a planned, intentional, community-sponsored activity, as we generally think about and practice it today, is simply not mentioned in the Bible. In fact, as far as we know, Jesus never spoke about Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, or other great religio-cultural traditions of his day, whatever he might have known about them. Nor did Jesus ever explicitly name interreligious dialogue as a Christian practice, or commission his disciples to go forth in mission throughout the world to establish interfaith forums with fellowship and fancy food from butter cookies to baklava. <laughs> So, as it turns out, 10 minutes is actually more than enough time. <laughs> On the other hand, Jesus and his disciples and earliest followers, as portrayed in the New Testament, did say a number of things that many Protestant Christians, especially in more progressive and ecumenically oriented churches over the last 50 years, have come to understand as helpful in providing a sound rationale for dialogical engagement with people committed to religious traditions other than their own, not merely as a take it or leave it leisure time activity, but in fact as a lifestyle commitment that is critically important for the healing of our broken and wounded world 
and closely tied to definitions of what it means to be a responsible global citizen and a faithful Christian in the 21st century. Of course, in no way can I even begin to describe over the next nine, eight minutes <laughs> the wide spectrum of different theologies of religions and attitudes toward interfaith activities that one can find today within Protestant communions, large and small, liberal and conservative. The options are simply too numerous. But perhaps you'll permit me to proceed rather by succinctly highlighting seven interdependent and scripture-based presuppositions or affirmations, my appreciation for which reflects the particular worldview and ethos of the liberal mainline Protestant denomination in which I was reared, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, at least as I experienced it. The mutually reinforcing character of the seven affirmations I will name you might say, have provided the space or the environment in which my interest in the history of religions and interfaith dialogue has blossomed. Perhaps ideas and values similar to the ones I name have shaped your own experience as well as your faith traditions were transmitted to you. In other cases, perhaps not so much. But when I talk about interreligious understanding as constituting an important contemporary Christian task, I typically, typically place the conversation in the context of biblical affirmations like the following. First, I often refer to the biblical teaching that there is but one God, a God who, according to the author of Luke Acts, shows no partiality, but accepts anyone who fears him and does what is right. A God who in past generations allowed all the nations to follow in their own ways, yet has never left himself without a witness in doing good. A God who is not far from each one of us, and who desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Second, in framing my remarks, I often recall that according to the first chapter in Genesis, God created humankind in God's own image. Therefore, the actual possibility of a relationship with God and with our neighbor is gifted to us in the divine act of creation itself. I've been influenced by teachers who insisted that we are children of the one God and we are created to be in relationship. Third, I usually lift up in considerations of religious pluralism the theological affirmation, which is closely related to the first two, that humankind is one family, that we are in reality brother and sister to one another, that all of the things that conceivably might separate us pale in significance to that which we share, that which binds us one to another, made as we are in the image of the Holy One. In fact, writes the author of 1 John, if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Moreover, those who say I love God and hate their neighbors and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Accordingly, for example, the thousands of children who will die today from a lack of water and clean food, whoever and wherever they are, are my children, our children. The fourth theological presupposition is one I was taught as a young child, often referred to as the golden rule. It appears in chapter six in the gospel according to Luke, following the list of blessings and woes. Jesus instructs those who would listen do to others as you would have them do to you. The practical application in dialogue is easy to imagine. If we want others to listen to or be patient with us, we must listen to and be patient with them. If we expect our dialogue partners to learn something from us, we cannot fail to expect to learn something from them. Interfaith dialogue requires the sharing of convictions with respectful mutuality. 
The fifth piece of practical theological counsel that I have long appreciated refers to the Ten Commandments of the Decalogue. And it appears in a 1979 publication from the World Council of Churches, one of the first such documents published on the subject. And the text reads in the Guidelines for Dialogue, Dialogue can be recognized as a welcome way of obedience to the commandment of the Decalogue, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Dialogue helps us not to disfigure the image of our neighbors of different faiths. In fact, we have learned that we cannot love our neighbors unless we sincerely try to know them and to know them in their own terms and as they understand themselves. Paradoxically, we have also become much more aware of the correlative truth that we cannot truly understand others and unless we first love them, unless we first respect and value them as precious children of God equal to all others. The sixth affirmation constitutes a clear rejection of supersessionism, that is the view that Christianity has fulfilled and even replaced Judaism as a God-ordained religion. Early in my high school days, I was introduced to the struggles of the Apostle Paul as he preached to the Gentiles to decide what to say about Judaism. The weight of scholarly opinion in the post-World War II period in my denomination has clearly supported the idea of the continuing validity and vitality of Judaism based on passages in Paul's letter to the Romans, such as, as regards election, they, the Jews, are beloved for the sake of their ancestors, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Or the passage, has God rejected God's people? By no means. So no matter what the theological orientation of my ministers and teachers, one thing was certain, the traditional exclusivist Christian position that outside the church there is no salvation is no longer universally applicable because of our new understandings of Paul's perspectives on Judaism. Finally, in theological discourse within the denomination, the idea that salvation depends solely on a confession of faith in Christ and baptism in the form of immersion was tempered by the observation that in chapter 25, the Gospel according to Matthew, Salvation appears to be more dependent on right action than on right belief. That is, when Jesus speaks of the coming judgment, the separation of the sheep on the right from the goats on the left, it depends on whether they gave food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, welcome to the stranger, clothes to the naked, care for the sick and imprisoned. The chapter is foundational for the Christian social gospel, but problematic for evangelical Christianity. In conclusion, it is the mutually reinforcing character of the highlighted affirmations that has provided, at least in part, a context in which interfaith dialogue has become meaningful for me. The challenge for you, I suppose, is to reflect on those scriptures in your own tradition which have brought you here today as a person interested in the religious other. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Jacobs. Jean is a former speaker at Trialogue, a member of Temple Israel, a reformed Jewish congregation. She holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education, an associate's degree in medical transcription, and certification in adult Jewish studies from Tulsa's Institute for Adult Jewish Studies. She retired in June and was just looking for something to do today, she told me. Please welcome Jean Jacobs. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'd like to point out before I begin that I put a um, a sheet on your tables which has some quotations that you might want to refer to. You don't have to read them while I'm talking, but they might be of interest to you later. 
Psalm 133 teaches, Hine matov umanayim, shevet achim gam yahad. How good and how pleasant it is that brothers and sisters dwell together. It's indeed good to be here, all of us children of God, regardless of our name for God, and to each of us created in God's image. Our topic today asks, what does Jewish tradition, specifically Reformed Jewish tradition, teach regarding our interactions with, our relationships to, people of other tr faith traditions? Is there value to participating in interfaith dialogue? Are there limitations? We Jews claim no monopoly on truth. Indeed, Rabbi Morris N. Kurtzer states, Jews regard Judaism as the only religion for Jews. <laughs> but we neither judge nor condemn the honest, devout worshiper of any faith. The Talmud tells us the righteous of all nations are worthy of immortality. We believe in certain basic ethical concepts, decency, kindliness, justice, and integrity. These we regard as eternal verities. But we claim no monopoly on these verities, for we re recognize that every great religious faith has discovered them." Unquote. First and foremost, we are taught to love our neighbors as ourselves, to reflect the golden rule in all our actions, to treat all people as we ourselves want to be treated. To be sure, we can find in scripture many instances in which our ancestors were admonished to shun neighboring nations. For example, in Deuteronomy 7, you must doom them to, dest to destruction, grant them no terms and give them no quarter. You shall not intermarry with them, do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from me to worship other gods. But we must remember that our forebears lived among idol-worshiping peoples. The admonishment was meant to keep our people from adopting idol worship. On the positive side of our dealings with our neighbors, scripture tells us no less than 36 times to love the stranger. This is where you'll find those citations I mentioned on your papers. The stranger, or ger in Hebrew, must be accorded the full rights and privileges of the native born. Equal justice must be accorded the stranger. Love of the stranger is a duty, and any discrimination against or oppression of him is prohibited. The prophets insisted on the protection of the stranger and the extension to him of justice and equal rights. The prophets imply in their teachings that the Jewish people have to bring the message of God's unity, the brotherhood and sisterhood of humankind, and peace to the world. Jewish thought is quite clear in holding that the Jewish people are part of the world and we are not to set ourselves apart from it. Indeed, Judaism has accepted influences from other cultures as have other religious traditions from ours. Jews care passionately about the welfare of our community and our nation, and it behooves us to know them through direct interaction. Yet, while ethnic pluralism is a good thing, maintaining our religious particularism is also important for us and for our partners in interfaith dialogue. Each of us must strive to ensure our continued distinctiveness, even while living fully in the diversity of our world. In discussing our relationships with our interfaith partners, Rabbi Mark Wachowski, chairman of the Reform Rabbinic Responsa Committee, comments in his book, Jewish Living, A Guide to Contemporary Reform Practice, that Christianity and Islam are respected as venerable monotheistic traditions. To the extent that Judaism shares some important religious and ethical doctrines with Christianity and Islam, we look with favor upon cooperative endeavors between the adherents of these three faiths directed toward the attainment of our common goals and aspirations, particularly in the realm of social justice." Unquote. He continues by endorsing the maintenance of friendly relationships with other faiths which may or may not be monotheistic. In some Reform Judaism, 
enthusiastically endorses interfaith dialogue and efforts in which all partners participate on an equal basis and with respect for the differences between the various traditions. Is there value in participating in interfaith dialogue? Absolutely. The more we know about other pathways to God, the less room there is for doubt, misunderstanding, fear, and hatred. Those of you who attended last week's Trilogue session will remember that Reverend Charles Kimball stated that our hope is in education. We have to humanize and put a, a human face on the other. And that one way we can do this is through cooperative efforts in the community. A few concrete examples. For the past 34 years, Temple Israel's Brotherhood and Sisterhood have sponsored annual interfaith dinners and luncheons. Our guests have included members of some 120 different Tulsa and nearby interfaith communities. I didn't really mean interfaith, I meant faith communities, different faith communities. At each occasion, presentations on selected themes of common interest have been made by Rabbi Sherman and guest clergy. These are some of our best attended programs of the year. We learn about other faiths, but also about our own. We mark our areas of commonality and of diversity. Breaking bread together emphasizes our common humanity and helps build bridges which bring us together. A number of years ago, Pastor Jim Hayner, then at Grace Lutheran Church, solicited his good friend Rabbi Charles Sherman's assistance in Pastor Hayner's Princeton University doctoral thesis project on interfaith relations. Paired couples and individuals from Grace Church and from Temple Israel studied together with both clergy our respective faith traditions over a six-month period. Each monthly session also included a meal, and participants were asked to spend social time with their study partners in between sessions. The project culminated in an interfaith trip to Israel. Our Lutheran friends witnessed our profound connections with our faith, especially as we worshiped on a Sabbath morning atop Masada, when we visited Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, and when we joyously celebrated Purim at the Hebrew Union College. We Jews were profoundly moved as we attended the Church of All Nations with our Lutheran friends, and when Pastor Hainer read from scripture as we sailed on the Sea of Galilee. Sharing these experiences led to genuine appreciation of both our faith traditions. Temple Israel is proud to have recently dedicated our second Interfaith Habitat for Humanity house. This one built with members of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, Boston Avenue Methodist Church, and the Institute for Interfaith Dialogue, a Turkish Muslim community. Given that Habitat CEO Reverend Paul Kent is a Baptist minister, and that the family for whom the house was built is of the Catholic, Roman Catholic faith, there were six different faith groups working side by side, week after week, in this profoundly meaningful endeavor. There was genuine concern, <coughs> excuse me, genuine concern and respect for each group's limitations on when we could work and what snacks we could share as we worked. We shared a common goal for the betterment of our community, indeed our world. Many years ago at a conference of what is now known as the Union for Reform Judaism, I attended a study session on Catholic Jewish dialogue presented by Father John Polakowski, director of the Catholic Jewish Studies Program at the Catholic Theological Union. What I distinctly remember from his presentation was his urging that the dialogue be an ongoing, continuing one, even when, and perhaps especially when, we have no crisis to discuss. With a firm foundation in understanding and respect, how much more effective can be our dialogue when we really do face difficult times? Are there limitations to our participation in interfaith dialogue? The goals of interfaith dialogue go beyond tolerance, as, as we used to call it. The goals should be mutual respect and appreciation. 
This includes being inclusive in our prayers at such occasions and being sensitive to one another's sacred traditions. And with that, I salute the OCCJ and its 30-year track record of promoting these practices in its monthly tri interfaith trilogue series, in its Jewish Christian dialogue group, in the youth trilogue and inter interfaith youth tour, in any town, in its open tables program, and certainly in this trilogue series. In remembrance of Moses' lifespan of 120 years, on birthdays, we Jews often wish each other Ad Mea Esrim to 120. So here's to OCCJ's next 90 and beyond. <laughs> Well said, well said, thank you. Our final speaker today is Dr. Jolie Jensen. She is the ha Hazel Rogers Professor of Communication at the University of Tulsa, where she teaches courses on media, culture, and society. Jolie has been a member of B'nai Amuna Synagogue since her conversion to Judaism in 2002. Would you please welcome Dr. Jolie Jensen. Well, hello everyone. I am uh, thrilled to be here, but I uh, really do feel like I'm the newcomer to this whole experience. As you heard, I, I'm a convert to Judaism, but I think it's even more important, I'm a convert to faith. And one of the interesting things as I've listened to these wonderful speakers today is to recognize how inexperienced I am with interfaith dialogue, but also how huge a gap it is between being a believer and a non-believer, or a person of faith and a person of no faith. And so I am completely unqualified to be standing up here today to talk about very much else other than what I understand, obviously, about the faith that I feel so fortunate to have found. But as people were talking, I just had an insight sitting up here that I'll share with you And um, as a media studies professor, because I was so taken with um, the notion of a movement of the heart that Sister Jane mentioned and thinking about the use of the term dialogue. So I think I'll stay under my 10 minutes if I take this little diversion and then talk about what I ought to repair. But the little diversion is um, to think about, when we say dialogue, we're thinking about the head. We really are thinking of speech and language. And to think about alternatives in the example that you just gave, Jean, about Habitat for Humanity, that's work of the hand. And that if we can think about moving from a dialogue, the head, to the heart, to the hand, to working together, to traveling together, to living, to praying together. Those are, those are different ways of connecting that um, are a form of communication, but not the one that comes to mind at first. So I feel like that's what I've learned today. I, I hope the others of you have other, other insights. What I, what I thought about as I was asked to do this, um, was the confusion that I felt as a as a young atheist um, when I heard about any interfaith problems at all. It was like, what was the big problem? I just couldn't grasp. As long as you believed in God, what was the problem? And so I just had a very naive and sort of baffling notion that all these people who shared this faith, what were they quibbling about? Um, obviously, I learned a lot more over time, but then as I discovered Judaism and found for the first time, I mean, I'd never read, I mean, I really was raised by atheists. I was atheist. I didn't, I had spiritual yearnings, but had no experience with scripture of any kind. But thus was, you know, not prejudiced against any religion either. I mean, I just had no role. I was just outside the conversation. Um, as I discovered Judaism, all I could do was learn everything I could about Judaism. And I just plunged in. I couldn't believe it. I felt like I'd found this faith that um, was perfect for me. I mean, I really felt called to it. Um, but I'm certainly not deeply erudite, and boy, is Hebrew hard to learn, let me tell you. But um, what, I, <laughs> what, I, what I recognized as I was thinking this through is these are the five elements of Judaism that I feel apply to the whole question of interfaith dialogue. The first is the obvious that we believe 
believe in many possible covenants. It's not um, just for us. You know, there are many, many different different relationships with God. Um, the second uh, is this no proselytizing. I mean, I was uh, gently turned away the re required three times when I uh, was talking about conversion. Uh, I was told that was what was happening too, which was helpful. But um, I, it's a it's a different relationship if you are not if you're in a faith that doesn't believe in proselytizing. Obviously, um, it's easier to engage in their faith dialogue. The, the, we were slaves in Egypt, so therefore is the is the third welcoming the strangers we've heard about. But the part that I want to focus on the most is this idea of study and debate and argument. One of the things that really drew me to the Jewish faith was the love of uh, deepening our understanding through debate. And one of the things that's been mentioned in passing here is the power of that. And I guess I want to argue, just like I began, that, that the, the kinds, what we learn from each other as we learn to fully appreciate and empathize from other faith traditions can only deepen our understanding of our own. And that that notion that we have to take and engage the other, deeply understand the position of someone else, and that empathetic dialogue is, of course, a lot of what uh, uh, is how we understand scripture. We always, as Jews, are arguing and debating interpretations and meanings. And it's just, for me, uh, totally exciting. You can imagine as a, being a college professor to discover I could do that in a, in a spiritual way, too, was really, was really very exciting. Um, but because of that, you can imagine the energy and zeal that we can bring to interfaith dialogue and, and that, that notion that we have and can learn from each other only if we fully inhabit and respect and understand other perspectives is a much more powerful, is a movement of the heart, I would argue, um, in, in a way that isn't just an intellectual encounter and certainly goes beyond dogma to a, a genuine respect and engagement. So um, I guess I guess I feel I've never done this before. I toss aside my remarks, but I um, whatever I prepared feels so thin and uh, beginner-like compared to what I've learned just from listening to um, the wonderful speakers today. I feel very honored to be here, and I look forward to learning much more about interfaith dialogue. Thanks. Thank you.